Hello, I'm Mark Pollitt, and welcome to Criminal and Civil Procedure. People doing digital forensics, whether they be law enforcement officers, uh, private investigators, uh, corporate investigators, information security people, uh, or electronic discovery folks, uh, in the end, you're going to ultimately uh, end up in a court. And so it's important to understand how those courts operate uh, and uh, what the process is. In this particular lecture, we're going to be talking about the federal system. And the reason we're going to talk about the federal system is it's the one system that everyone in America has in common. Each state has their own set of rules and their own uh, kinds of courts, and they're called different things. Uh, but, uh, and it's important to know what the system is in the state that you're living in, working in, or going to testify in. Uh, but they are all in many ways similar to the federal system, and uh, particularly when it comes to the, the rules, uh, very often we'll use the, the federal system of rules uh, as their template in modifying them uh, to meet the individual state's constitution uh, and their needs. Well, the federal courts were established uh, by the constitution. There's actually a, a section in the constitution that uh, calls for the establishment of a federal judiciary. And it gives Congress the right to create lower courts which they have. They have created basically two kinds of courts. One is called general Jur jurisdiction courts. And these are courts that um, handle most civil and most criminal things uh, and are uh, commonly used uh, by a large portion of the population. The Congress has also created a number of specialized courts that have limited uh, and specialized jurisdiction and we're going to talk about some of those. Um, but all courts uh, have one of two functions. Uh, the first is what are called trial courts. They're also referred to by an old common law term of art called, and they're called courts of original jurisdiction. Um, when you go to uh, um, be prosecuted or when you go to sue someone, uh, this is the court to which you go. Uh, trial courts are triers of fact. They're the ones that actually have witnesses come before them uh, and they weigh evidence and uh, they make decisions about the cases at hand. Appellate courts, on the other hand, are review courts. They primarily review the record of the trial courts. Sometimes they will admit some new evidence, uh, but generally speaking, they're largely paper chases. Uh, they are the uh, original parties uh, appealing uh, to a higher authority to overturn something that happened at a trial court, uh, whether uh, it was uh, uh, the plaintiff or the defendant or the uh, uh, defendant or the prosecution. Uh, in the end, uh, they review other courts' actions. And so uh, that's the second function that courts make, and usually there are different courts for that. In the federal system, the courts of original jurisdiction are the district courts. Uh, there are a number of district courts, as we're going to see around the country. Um, they are arranged in a political uh, fashion, uh, and I say political that they uh, uh, match the political boundaries of the uh, state that they're in, and uh, will actually divvy up sometimes between those states. Uh, as an example, uh, Delaware is a very small state, Rhode Island is a very small state, so they have the United States District Court for Delaware and the United States District Court for Rhode Island. Uh, New York, on the other hand, is a much larger state, and so they actually have uh, four different uh, uh, district courts. They have the uh, United States District Court for the Eastern District of New York, they have the Southern District of New York, uh, the uh, Northern District of New York, and the Western District of New York. Um, and other states have similar fashions. Uh, Florida has southern, middle, and northern. Um, a number of districts uh, will be combined uh, for appellate purposes, and those courts that deal with appeals of d U.S. District Court uh, judgments uh, are called Circuit Courts of Appeal. And um, they're called circuit courts for an interesting reason. 
Uh, in the old days, there was not uh, enough uh, uh, call for these things to have uh, a judge in, in one place all the time, and uh, appeals would only be heard uh, after a number of, uh, of lower court decisions were made and were ready for appeal. And so the judges appointed the Court of Appeals would literally ride on horseback from courthouse to courthouse along a circuit. And uh, the circuit would take some period of time to go around, and by the time they got done uh, with the circuit, then it was time to start out uh, again. Um, they, uh, they meet either in panels, usually of three, uh, or en banc, which is the entire Circuit Court of Appeals uh, reviewing a single de decision. By the way, I should have told you that in, uh, in district courts, the primary judges there are district court judges. They're appointed by the president, and they're uh, uh, are nominated by the president, and they're approved by the Senate, um, and they serve for life. Um, and uh, they, in turn, the district court judges in a given district, appoint some lesser judges called magistrate judges. They used to be called U.S. magistrates. Now they're called magistrate judges. They actually work for uh, the district court judges. They serve for a, a term and can be reappointed. Um, they handle most of the routine uh, intake and some of the uh, 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 pre-trial motions uh, for the district court judges, basically taking a lot of the uh, the scut work uh, off the uh, district court judges' uh, 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 plate. By the way, district court judges are about as close to God as, uh, as anybody on earth gets. Uh, virtually there's nobody that can tell them, including the chief district court judge, what to do. Um, the only power that a, a chief district court judge has is, is uh, assigning uh, district court judges to particular cases. Once they get their cases, there's really nobody that can tell them what to do. Even the circuit courts, um, they can remand uh, to the district court judges and they can overturn district court judges, uh, but in the end, uh, their ability to, uh, to actually control their courtrooms is pretty limited. And of course, the ultimate appellate court in this country is the United States Supreme Court. And they will only review cases uh, that are uh, when people ask them to review them and when they decide to review them. Uh, you apply to the U.S. Supreme Court to have your case uh, reviewed and uh, they decide if they're going to do it and if they do they issue what's called a writ of certiorari, that's a, abbreviated normally cert, uh, and when a case is given cert then it's allowed to be uh, or argued before the Supreme Court. It's a very limited number of cases that the Supreme Court handles every year, uh, and they meet in November. Uh, and so, uh, uh, very few cases actually go to the Supreme Court. Interestingly enough, the Supreme Court is, by law, uh, the court of original jurisdiction for several different kinds of things, not the least of which is jurisdictional, uh, geographical jurisdictional disputes between states. Uh, a number of years ago, the state of Maine and the state of New Hampshire argued about which island, uh, about which state owned a particular island, and the U.S. Supreme Court actually sat as a trial court to uh, make that decision. By the way, New Hampshire won. Uh, this is a map uh, of the uh, federal uh, circuits, and you can see that each uh, circuit is numbered and colored, uh, and they uh, cover a number of different states, uh, and they start their numbering up in the northeast. Um, and you can see that uh, some are larger than others. Uh, as an example, the Ninth Circuit is uh, one of the biggest. It's also uh, the most liberal of all of the uh, circuits. Um, interestingly enough, the most conservative is the Fourth Circuit, uh, which is based in Richmond, Virginia. Um, and uh, uh, other uh, districts uh, have different reputations. Some are notably more uh, conservative than others, uh, but uh, uh, each of them has its own flavor. By the way, when a uh, case is taken from a district court to the circuit court and the circuit court uh, comes up with an opinion and says okay this is or is not appropriate um, that decision is uh, mandatory for all the judges within that circuit but is not mandatory merely advisory for any other circuit and so what typically happens is uh, when the ninth circuit decides something uh, very liberally and the fourth circuit decides it uh, 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 decides it in a very conservative fashion that sooner or later somebody will uh, have a case and they will take it to the Supreme Court and say you know these two are incompatible and, and my case wouldn't have been uh, 
solved correctly, and so the Supreme Court decides that they're going to take on a case uh, to basically sort out these differences uh, in, uh, in circuit court opinions. Once the Supreme Court rules, then it's mandatory on everyone. There are these other courts that we talked about, um, these specialized courts. One is the U.S. Bankruptcy Court. Uh, bankruptcy, as you can imagine, is a, is a big deal and there are lots of them. And so uh, in order to keep them out of the, uh, the normal uh, flow of, of civil, and, civil and criminal cases, they've created a separate bankruptcy court. And as you'll see, the numbers for that are pretty amazing. There's another court called the U.S. Court of Federal Claims. And that's an interesting one because it's the court in which you sue the United States government. The United States government is uh, a governmental in institution and as a result, uh, by law, has what's called sovereign immunity. If they don't choose to, you can't sue them. But very often, as a matter of public policy, the United States will agree to be sued. And so they have to have a court for you to go sue them in, and that's the U.S. Court of Federal Claims. There's a separate court, used to be called uh, the Military Court, but it's now or Military Court of Appeals. Now it's called the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces. They serve the same purpose as the Circuit Court does uh, for the Armed Forces. Uh, so if you uh, want to appeal your court martial. Uh, which is the military system of justice, then you will appeal it to the United States Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces. Um, there's a separate court for tax issues, uh, and that's the U.S. Tax Court. It's rather interesting that the uh, U.S. Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces is across the street from the U.S. Tax Court in D.C. The uh, U.S. Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces is a two or three story building that's uh, maybe a hundred 150 feet square or something like that. Uh, the U.S. Court of Appeal, uh, I mean the U.S. Tax Court is this beautiful gleaming uh, one square block, four story building, uh, lots of glass and, uh, and chrome. There's another one, another court, the U.S. Court for International Trade and that uh, resolves uh, international trade disputes. So, and there are a number of others, but uh, just so you know that there are some of these other uh, specialty uh, limited jurisdiction federal courts. Um, as we've talked before, there are basically two kinds of law. There's civil law and criminal law. And the uh, first uh, one we're going to talk about is civil procedure. Uh, and it's guided by a set of rules. There's the U.S. Uh, 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 rules, which are the federal rules of civil procedure. The first link that you see on the screen there is the actual uh, law that, uh, that sets down the, uh, the, the FRCP, as it's usually abbreviated. The much easier uh, and clearer way to access these rules is through Cornell's uh, law school website, and that's the second link that you'll see on there. Um, civil and criminal procedures are slightly different, uh, um, and so you need to apply the right set of rules to the right kind of case. Um, the next slide is about what the actual process is for uh, a civil case. Generally speaking, these are lawsuits. The case starts when one lawyer files uh, some paper with the clerk of the court and says, Dear court, uh, we have been wronged, and these no good nicks are the ones that did it to us, and we are suing them for everything that they own. And by the way, we have given them notice that we are suing them, and so they have to do that. So that's called a filing. The formal name for it is called a pleading. And then, of course, the uh, uh, poor defendant that's getting sued by the, by the way, the person that starts this whole process is called a plaintiff. And the other person whom they're suing is called the defendant. And so the defendant gets their attorney, and their attorney uh, comes back, and they make a pleading and says, Dear court, we are not guilty of this. These are nothing but spurious uh, complaints by uh, somebody that's trying to get money out of us poor, uh, you know, rich business people. And so obviously there's a disagreement there. And so uh, what will then happen uh, is that a judge will be assigned, and sometimes a magistrate judge will be uh, assigned, and they will have a pretrial conference. And this pretrial conference is basically the judge sitting there and saying, okay, I've read your pleadings, guys. What's this case really about? What are you really going to, to try to prove? 
how much time is it going to take to do this, how expensive is it going to be. Oh, and by the way, I really think that you don't have a very good case here, uh, and so I think you guys ought to work this out yourself. And in fact, judges will spend huge amounts of time and effort to essentially try to do what's called a pre-trial diversion. Basically get the folks to, to solve this without resort to the courts, because as you will see, actually going to trial is a hugely expensive thing, especially in a federal civil case. Federal civil cases cost millions of dollars to run, uh, and so uh, they will do everything they can to uh, try to, uh, to do a pretrial uh, diversion. But if they can't do that, then they'll say, all right, you guys are going to go to trial. So now what evidence do each of you need? And that's called the discovery process. And both sides will say, your honor, we need everything in the world. And the other side says, no, they don't need any of this stuff, but we actually need all this stuff that's the size of the world. And they will go back and forth. <clears throat> the court will sort that out and will issue uh, discovery orders. Discovery orders are essentially a legal order to produce the, the evidence as requested. Once the attorneys have all of the discovery orders and all the evidence, um, and sometimes even before, they will start making motions and they'll say, Your Honor, the other side's doing this and that's not right, not, not fair. They're not giving us what we need. Uh, this is stuff that they shouldn't be able to do use. This is stuff that we should be able to protect. And it'll go back and forth and the judge and or the magistrate judge will rule on those evidentiary uh, motions typically. Uh, sometimes the motions are for dismissal and that sort of thing, but in the end, uh, it, all of these things are called pretrial motions. And they will try to do uh, settlement efforts, and they'll try to do alternate dis dispute re resolution again to try to get pretrial diversion. Um, so this, the pretrial diversion really goes through the whole pretrial part. But once, uh, once all that fails, then we go to, go to trial. And there's two kinds of trials. They're called jury trials and bench trials. In the case of a jury trial, you have just that, a jury. And the jury is selected from a pool uh, within the, the geographical area of the court. And the jury are the finders of fact. And um, they decide what really happened here. And then they, in turn, in a civil case, get to assign a uh, liability to uh, the plaintiff or the uh, defendant or defendants. The judge in a jury trial basically acts as the legal referee. The judge deals with all issues of law. Can we do this? Can we not do that? The judge actually runs the trial itself uh, and controls uh, all of the legal aspects of it and ensures that the lawyers are doing what they're supposed to do. The judge really only acts as his referee until after the jury uh, uh, comes back with their verdict and after that then the judge basically implements what the uh, the jury has come back with uh, and assuming that it's within the the bounds of uh, the jury instructions that they were given now the defendant can choose to be tried at what's called a bench trial and this is where the judge acts as both the finder of fact and the legal referee and you might think well what's the advantage in that well, if the defendant feels that the case is really about the finer points of law and that this is a case that really needs to be looked at uh, really from a very clinical perspective and we don't uh, want uh, uh, the, the picture of uh, deformed children uh, impressing the, the jury, um, then they may choose to have the judge act as, a, as the finder of fact uh, with the idea in mind uh, with some justification that the judge is going to rule on it in an entirely clinical legal perspective. Assuming that it's a jury trial then you go on to jury selection and that's a whole process uh, and includes something called voir dire. Uh, it's a different voir dire from the voir dire that you're going to be exposed to as expert witnesses uh, but it's an interesting process uh, in and of itself. Trials are very often won or lost in jury selection and there are people that make their living uh, being jury consultants, uh, basically working with lawyers and trying to get the, quote, best jury they can. Uh, once a jury is actually impaneled and charged by the, by the judge, then each of the attorneys uh, have their opening statements. 
and uh, once that's completed then the plaintiff will present their evidence uh, and uh, the defense gets to cross-examination gets to cross-examine then the defense puts up uh, their evidence and each time they put up evidence uh, uh, there's the opportunity to have evidence rulings yes you can use it no you can't uh, and then sometimes there's even evidence rulings at the end saying, you know, based upon what happened in this trial, the other side shouldn't be able to use all of this stuff. And so they will instruct the jury to disregard this particular group of evidence. Not a uh, terribly desirable way of doing things, and judges try to avoid that, but sometimes it happens. But in the end, uh, after the last evidence ruling and the last evidence is presented, then each of the parties uh, get to give their closing arguments. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you should find for the defendant, you should find for the plaintiff because. And they uh, try to make their best argument. And then the judge does the one of the most important things that, uh, that happens in a civil trial. He gives the jury their instructions and teaches them about what the law is and what the standard of proof is. This is so important that most judges will ask both of the party's attorneys to draft uh, model instruction and standard of proof uh, instruction for the jury. And usually the plaintiff and the defendant will both submit proposed instructions. And the judge will then take those and review them and come up with his own set, typically uh, incorporating some of the elements of uh, both parties. But it's ultimately the judge's job to make sure that the jury understands what the law is and what the standard of proof is. And the judge instructs the jury, and only the judge can instruct the jury. One of the things that lawyers cannot do on their closing arguments is say, you know, this is what the law says, and this is how you have to find for us. That's actually a really bad thing to do, and we'll get them disciplined. The jury then goes out and does their deliberations, and they come back with a verdict. And once they have, the judge says, okay, I find uh, uh, in accordance with the jury's in, uh, instruction, and if you don't like it, you get to go appeal. And so that's the process. It's not quite like TV, and it's very, very complex. Civil cases in the federal system typically take years. They're not rapid processes at all, and they're very expensive. The other kind are criminal procedures, and by state standards, federal uh, uh, Criminal trials are far more complex and, uh, and far bigger uh, productions uh, than they are in the state court system. But nonetheless, the elements of the federal rules of civil, um, you know, criminal procedure uh, are, uh, again, the model for many states, and so they uh, are worth studying. And again, the first link that you uh, see for the uh, FRCRP, which is the way it's usually abbreviated for the criminal procedures, um, is the original and the second one is Cornell's uh, law school stuff. We will be dealing with the uh, FRCP, uh, FRCRP uh, more extensively in another lecture, but again, I just want to go over the general process. It's very, very similar to the civil case. The only, the, one of the major differences is how it all starts. Uh, a, civil, a criminal case is started when the government files an indictment or an information. Indictment is a statement by a grand jury after being presented with evidence by the government that says that there is sufficient probable cause to believe that uh, the defendant committed a particular crime. If the case is a misdemeanor or if the defendant agrees, then the government can file basically a statement saying that this is that there is probable cause to believe uh, that uh, a crime has been committed uh, and that the defendant did it, and that's called an information. Uh, but the case starts with either an indictment or an information. The pretrial activity is a little bit of a misnomer because uh, while the arraignment uh, is certainly a judicial thing that happens in pretrial, the investigation part of it is generally pretty much done. Um, in the federal system, you don't get to actually indict somebody, uh, or for that matter, usually even arrest them, unless the investigation uh, has been approved up and down the food chain. And federal prosecutors are very, very leery of charging anyone that they can't convict. And so the, the batting average on federal cases is extremely high, uh, depending on the kind of violation, anywhere from 80 to 95%. Um, 
So uh, a lot of investigation has been done beforehand. Uh, but uh, once the indictment or information has been filed, then typically the defendant is forced to appear before the court. You know, that uh, appearance may be as a result of being arrested or it may be a voluntary appearance. Uh, you'll see on TV where uh, high profile uh, defendants in federal cases uh, uh, are volunteer voluntarily appearing in court uh, at uh, 9 o'clock in the morning to answer charges. Well, that's the arraignment. And in arraignment, uh, the judge, or more commonly the magistrate judge, will formally notify the defendant that you have been charged by the government with this crime and here are the particulars of that crime and here's the violation of the crime and here are your rights as a defendant. Um, and uh, sometimes they will ask for uh, a plea, sometimes they will not. Uh, there's some rules about when they you know, do that. Uh, but in the end, it's, uh, it's a pretty much a formality. Typically the defendants do nothing but answer yes or no at arraignments. Um, unlike uh, state arraignments where they will also do a probable cause hearing, in the federal system that does not occur. Uh, there's only a few times in the federal system where you do a probable cause hearing and they're not uh, typically at arraignment. Um, generally speaking, unless the government decides to drop the case for some reason uh, or the defendant dies, um, the trial will proceed. And again, uh, most trials are jury trials. The defendant has a right to a jury trial. Uh, but if the defendant chooses, they can have a bench trial. And again, like a civil bench trial, the judge acts as both the finder of fact and the legal referee. And again, the, the kinds of trials that you would want uh, a bench trial if you were a defendant is one where you're concerned of how a jury would react. If you're uh, Bernard Madoff, um, and uh, you stole lots and lots of people's money, you might have been better off with a bench trial than in a jury trial. Um, but in any case, if it's a jury trial, again, you have jury selection, which uh, essentially looks identical to what it does in the civil uh, case. The actual trial uh, proceeds in exactly the same order, uh, and the, the, again, the instructions uh, are uh, typically, uh, there's some input from both parties uh, in that. Uh, the jury uh, does their deliberations and reaches a verdict, uh, and uh, uh, if found guilty, the uh, judge will then uh, find judgment saying you are guilty. Uh, and by the way, nobody is guilty until they're judged, which is after the, the, uh, the jury uh, responds. Um, and then usually at a later date, the, the defendant is sentenced. Uh, the defendant has a right to appeal. Uh, and those appeals uh, are done with the uh, Circuit Court of Appeals. So that's the federal civil pro I mean criminal process and uh, it's a, a model for how the states work. Again, each state has uh, its own rules uh, and uh, some procedures that are a little different. So it's important that you know uh, your state's uh, particular uh, rules. I put this slide up from the uh, Federal uh, Judicial Center just uh, in case some of you haven't been in a real courtroom. Uh, it's not like you see in law, law and order most of the time, um, but uh, there are a number of people involved, obviously the judge, uh, the U.S. Marshal. Uh, typically the, the marshals don't uh, stand behind the judges. They will typically be at the uh, back of the, the courtroom, although uh, sometimes the, they will be elsewhere. Um, there is a court reporter and a, a deputy clerk uh, who will sit uh, typically in front of the judge, uh, usually below and in front of the judge, uh, and they are officers of the court. Uh, and then there is a witness box. Uh, typically the witness box is between the judge and the jury. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, if there's a need for an interpreter, uh, that interpreter will typically be between the witness and the jury. And then the two parties uh, will each have their own trial tables uh, in front of the, the uh, judge. Um, there are some local rules about who sits closest to the jury, and I've seen it done both ways, where the uh, prosecution is closer to the jury, and I've seen it where the defense is closer to the jury. Uh, but it's done the same way in, in, the, in each uh, court, uh, in the, the local court, so you just need to find out ahead of time which table is going to be yours. It's interesting to see the number of cases. Um, in the 
in the United States totally, and this, this number is like 10 years old, uh, but it probably hasn't changed dramatically, there were roughly uh, 30 million legal cases, which is astounding considering that that's uh, roughly uh, one for every 10 Americans. Um, of those 30,000 cases, the vast, I mean 30 million cases, the vast majority of them are state cases. Right? And uh, only about 1 in 30 cases is a federal case. So you can see that most of the legal work in this country is done in state courts, not in the federal system. But then if you look at the actual federal cases, that 1 million cases that uh, the feds do annually, about 70% of those, or 700,000 cases, are bankruptcy cases, which is also a pretty staggering number given the population of the United States. Only 10% of those 1 million cases, right, or roughly 100,000 cases a year, are criminal cases. And roughly double that number are civil cases. By the way, in the state court system, uh, something like 10 to 20% are uh, uh, criminal cases and the rest are civil. So uh, even the state system, the vast majority are civil. Uh, the states do not have bankruptcy courts, by the way. The feds are the only ones that can do bankruptcy. Uh, so the, the state courts have uh, about 80, 20 or so uh, civil versus criminal. But in the federal system, it's uh, 10 and 20 percent. There are about 1,700 uh, U.S. Uh, federal judges and uh, almost 30,000 state uh, and local judges. So you can see how much larger their system is. It's important to remember a couple things. Courts have a physical jurisdiction. Uh, state courts can only practice within their state. The, the federal uh, district courts uh, within their district and the federal uh, circuit courts within their uh, designated circuit. They also have legal jurisdiction, whether they're general jurisdiction or specialized jurisdiction. Uh, and uh, uh, that uh, uh, jurisdiction uh, uh, can be based on geography or the physical person. For instance, uh, certain courts have jurisdiction over U.S. Uh, citizens overseas. There are trial and appellate courts. Uh, trial courts are finders of fact, and appellate courts review the, the legal act actions of the trial courts. There are similar and there are civil and criminal cases which have similar processes but have different sets of procedural rules. And the vast majority of trials are state and local. Well, that's it for this lecture. Until next time, have a good day.